Some corporations have very creative ways to avoid paying taxes. Sophisticated strategies, offshore tax havens, and a smattering of tax loopholes can actually make avoiding paying taxes fairly simple, and it's all legal. But is it right? Joining us now for more in Vancouver, British Columbia, Diana Gibson. She's president with the Canadians for Tax Fairness. And with us here in studio, Al Meiji, partner and tax litigator with Osler LLP. And we welcome both of you to our broadcast tonight. Uh, Diana, let me start with you. The, the documentary, which is going to air right after this program is over, talks about billions of dollars being secreted away in offshore accounts, Cayman Islands, Barbados, Bermuda, those kinds of places. My question for you is, it's all legal, but is there anything wrong with that? Well, in the end, what, what matters most is that it, it is impacting on our society negatively. And the reason for that is if you don't redistribute wealth, you have income inequality growing, and you see governments unable to fund social programs that are important for improving the livelihoods of lower income people, and you see that gap widening, which is what we've been seeing consistently in Canada, that widening gap between the bottom and the top end in terms of inequality. And so if the government can't tax those corporations and redistribute that income through social programs, investment in education, training, hiring public sector workers, things like that, then we see a negative effect. And, you know, the International Monetary Fund, not a bastion of left-wing thought, has said that too much inequality is bad for not just the people, but also for the economic growth. It actually stifles economic growth. Okay. Al, your view on this? I think that she's, uh, Diana is exactly right. We have some serious issues of economic inequality. Uh, we have some serious issues of addressing distribution of wealth, et cetera, but I don't think that's quite the question. Um, the, the, the government of the day is entitled to pass laws and rules to collect uh, the revenues that they deem appropriate to provide the services that the government should. So this isn't about, uh, about corporations uh, you know, not paying their taxes. They're paying all of the taxes that they're obliged to this is a question of government policy. If governments choose to have a policy uh, which allows certain things to happen, there's really nothing to complain about as long as the corporations that you speak of are doing what they are legally obliged to do. Let me follow on that with you, Diana. I mean, the, the fact is corporations are not going to pay more tax than they have to. So is your real beef here with policymakers as opposed to private companies? Um, I think it's really important to recognize that it's both. I mean, the government needs to close the loopholes and needs to make sure it's taxing effectively. And, um, and there's certainly some really great examples I can give you of where the Canadian government has under, undermined our ability to tax. Um, so that's one big issue. But, you know, when corporations are using things like transfer pricing to get the money outside of the country and into places like Switzerland or other jurisdictions where they can pay a lower tax on it, um, then it is also about avoidance. And, you know, there's a massive industry in the documentary that's going to be shown it shows this massive industry of lawyers and accountants that are focusing heavily on helping those corporations to, un to, to avoid be paying tax. Um, now, you know, he's right in that some of those loopholes exist and it's not the corporation's fault. It's the CEO's job to minimize tax and maximize profit. That's the way corporations are set up and structured. So, you know, he's right on that account, except that where they're using things like instruments like transfer pricing to you know, for example, channel, Starbucks channeled all their coffee through Switzerland. There's no coffee produced in Switzerland, but all their coffee was bought from Switzerland. Things like that start to cross the line into unethical. All right, let's just make sure that we understand this because this is not BNN, this is TVO. Uh, I can't assume that our audience uh, understands all of the jargon that's being used here. Al, I run business ABC. My employees work in Ontario. The money we make is from customers in Ontario. How do I take the money that I make in Ontario and move it somewhere else, and what is the advantage of moving it to, let's say, Cayman Islands? Yeah, but let, let me, uh, I'll answer your question using exactly the language that Diana used, transfer pricing. Diana says, you know, the use of transfer pricing as a way of avoiding taxes. Well, what is transfer pricing? Let's take a simple example, uh, an actual example. Mm -hmm. I am GlaxoSmithKline. I manufacture uh, a drug in Canada, uh, Zentac, a drug that you're well aware of. To manufacture my drug, I have to use an active ingredient, which I have to buy from the manufacturer of that active ingredient, which is a company in, uh, in the UK or in a foreign jurisdiction. So I buy the active ingredient for my drug from them, and I pay them. And the law is that I can only pay them fair market value. 
So I pay them fair market value and buy the drug, and then I use that ingredient to manufacture Zantac and I sell it. Well, the complaint apparently is this is a bad thing to do. I don't understand how it can be a bad thing to do. The law requires that I pay no more than the fair market value. I paid fair market value. And if I didn't pay, mo if I paid more than fair market value, then the law prohibits me from doing it. So what's happening in this documentary and in some of the comments that you know, some have made, and I think you see that in Diana's comment, is, is, is language is used, just transfer pricing as a way of avoiding taxes. Transfer pricing is simply a rule that says you can't pay more than fair market value for goods and services that you buy. Should you, should you be allowed to pay fair market value? I think so. So I'm, I'm not sure where the problem is. Diana, is there no problem here? <laughs> Well, I mean, we, there's some great examples in the film. Um, one is uranium that's um, being channeled through a low tax jurisdiction where they're doing all the buying a jurisdiction that doesn't produce uranium. So again, the example that was used was buying a product from the jurisdiction where it's produced. We're talking about um, companies you know, buying all their coffee out of Switzerland. They don't grow coffee in Switzerland. Or buying all their uranium out of Switzerland at $10 a, a pound when it's actually market value is $180 so, a pound. So you want the So there's lots of examples where You want governments to close these used. loopholes in, is that right? Um, and you know, it needs to be, corporations need to be held account for doing things like buying all their coffee out of Switzerland at a lower market price and paying the tax there instead of here. There's, there's lots of different ways that can be done. Um, so part of it's the government needs to close the loopholes. And then there's going to need to be some corporations called to account. And in the UK, for example, the government actually held a hearing and brought the head of Amazon, Starbucks, and Google to the table to, talk, to call them to account for how they're implementing instruments like transfer pricing. Okay, let me pick the up Canadian on that government with Al. Let me, done that. Sorry, Diana, we were just, uh, time is at a premium here, and I want to make sure we get to all of our questions here. In the documentary, the hearings that were held in the UK, there are some excerpts of those hearings. And one of the politicians looked across the table at some of the corporate executives and said, you know, what you're doing may be legal, but it's immoral. Is there anything immoral about what you're doing? Absolutely not. How, do, how and, not? And, and I'll tell you why. In, in our context, in Canada, there is absolutely nothing immoral. We have a rule in our system that was introduced 25 years ago that requires Canadian corporations not just to comply with the text of the language, not just to comply with the words of the statute, but it requires them to comply with the object, spirit, and the purpose of the law. So if a corporation complies with the wording of the law, the spirit of the law, the purpose of the law, the intention behind the law, and it organizes its affairs to reflect all of that, how can you be immoral? Well, I'll answer the question. Uh, if you watch the documentary, you'll see former Finance Minister Michael Wilson and you'll see former Finance Minister the late Jim Flaherty both saying they took Herculean efforts to close loopholes which they thought were inappropriate. These are two conservative finance ministers. And in both cases, they found that they were up against such mountain, mountains of lobbyists from corporate Canada who did everything they could to make sure those loopholes didn't get closed that finally they had to throw up their hands and, and give up. But so that, that's the issue. But that's, that's political failure. That's, that's a finance minister standing up and saying, you know, I couldn't do my job because I was really lobbied. That's no it's answer. That's not, actually, an answer to, that's not an answer to the corporations who comply with the law. But, you know, since you're talking about, I, I just want to respond to the, the comment you made about the documentary. Mm -hmm. Let's take one of the cases they talk about, and I'll just use two minutes to illustrate the point. A case called Canada Trusco which they use in the documentary to illustrate bad behavior. Here's a case, Canada Trusco, a subsidiary of TD Bank, does a transaction. The, Can the Can Canada Revenue Agency comes in and says, you know, we don't think that you have done uh, what you're required to do. And they take, uh, take Canada Trusco to the courts. We go to the Tax Court of Canada, a trial judge, looking at all of the evidence, says, Canada Trusco, you've complied with the letter of the law, the spirit of the law, and the purpose of the law. We win. Goes up to the Court of Appeal. Three judges now independently look at the same issue. Three judges conclude exactly the same thing. Did the you represent them? Yes, I did. And, did. The, and, and, and then and, and the government loses again. They go up to the Supreme Court, and now nine judges ask the same question. So Canada Trusco has now had to go before essentially 13 judges and explain that the transaction they did was not just compliant with the words. They weren't just playing with words, but it complied with Parliament's purpose. 
And so here you have 13 judges who have signed off saying this company complied with everything, and they are featured in a documentary okay, as, me, as having done something inappropriate. Let me get Diana's view on that. Do you want to react to that, Diana? Yeah, a couple of things. First, um, I want to um, turn, you know, I'll speak to the legal issue and that I think there actually should be a lot more calling corporations to account in court, not less, when we're talking about over $80 million per year estimated foregone revenues, if not much, much more, and we're uh, in the billions and we're, and we're cutting public sector jobs and programs for people with disabilities, then I think that those lawsuits are critical. Um, and then the other piece is that lobbying piece that was raised where the finance minister threw his hands in the air. Um, what we're seeing is uh, it's a Tea Party agenda that's come over from the United States, driven by um, you know folks like Grover Norquist, who said they want to see government shrunk to the size where they can drown it in a bathtub. That's a quote from Grover Norquist, a right-wing think leader, a thought leader in the U.S. conservative movement. Um, that movement against taxes is a coordinated campaign to, uh, to undermine taxes. Corporations are funding think tanks and lobbyists. And when we talk about the pressure that finance minister was under, minister when it was under, it's not small. It's not a small failure for him to throw his hands up. It's a very large, well-funded, coordinated corporate campaign to undermine taxes and get tax rates down. And that campaign is tied into problems we have with, with public uh, po political financing and pressures brought on to, to governments by corporations. And so it's not a small problem that was identified there, that the, the pressure he was under uh, around not fixing those problems. Yep. Uh, it's, a, it's a massive problem in Canada and one that costs us greatly at the human level. I, I think that David Dodge had exactly the right answer. This to is the former governor of the Bank of Canada. Who was a, also was, was a remarkable deputy minister, mm -hmm. uh, a distinguished public, public servant who said, I mean, he had the best line in the documentary where he said, you know, uh, we get the governments we elect. So if we go to the polls and we choose governments that have a political philosophy of lower taxes, uh, they believe that high taxes or you know, certain levels of taxation impede uh, the success of a growing economy, and we elect those governments, then that's the policy we get. My answer to, to, to my friend is that your complaint is not, your complaint is, is solved at the ballot box. You know, the it's answer is it's a political yeah. issue. The answer is to elect yeah. governments that articulate and reflect your policy view. I mean, we have two competing visions. There are those who believe that taxes are the price we pay for civilization and we ought to fund good public services. And I happen to be one of those guys. I happen to be, I share a lot of the values that Diana has about, about what kind of society we want to live in. And then there are others, for example, the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, who believe that taxes are not a, excessive taxes are not a good thing. They believe Actually, that they impede. I think they're evil. The evil, yeah. and, and and they have a legitimate, mm -hmm. uh, they have an entitlement to have that political viewpoint. And we all go to the ballot box. We choose the government. We choose, and we get the policies all we right. do. But, but what I this. don't think is the issue here is you can't point the finger at taxpayers who then comply with the laws that the, the politicians we elect create. So they are not... Let me, I have to, right. Can I have to speak to the election issue, if yes, that's possible? Please. Go ahead. Um, we have a first-past-the-post system in Canada, which means the majority of Canadians did not support or elect the Conservative government. We saw when they cut the GST that the majority of Canadians in polling actually would have preferred the GST stay higher and have the social program. So the, the tax agenda is not a public agenda. It's a Conservative right-wing agenda that is served by a broken political system where first past the post means that the Conservatives can win with less than the majority of the Canadian population. I'm with you and Andrew Coyne. I think there is a problem with the first past the post system and we have to change that. But okay. again, that's beside so the point. So I would point. say yes. the tax agenda does not represent people's ballot box choices or the Canadian public's pre preferences. And the problem with fixing loopholes is tied to corporate lobbying, not uh, uh, something okay. that the Canadian public supports. Fair enough, Diana, fair enough. Let me try this though, what, what I hope is a useful question here. If we were able to repatriate, let's take the high estimate that the documentary puts forward, $180 billion annually of money that right now the Treasury does not enjoy because it's offshore or it's in a you know, tax shelter or it's uh, going through a tax loophole or somehow the Minister of Finance can't get his hands on it. If we were able to repatriate that much money, would there be consequences associated with that? And by that I mean, would there be businesses that would shut down because they'd find the tax climate here no longer favorable? That kind of thing. What do you think? 
That's Absolutely, um, you would see some tax avoidance, but what you see, it's interesting, on the tax location question, I actually saw a survey of corporations as to where they located their head offices, and the location of the CEO's mother-in-law was a bigger factor than the taxes in the jurisdiction as to whether they <laughs> located there. Now, I can't tell you if that was closer or further away from the mother-in-law, <laughs> but I can tell you there's a lot of factors in, that come into play in terms of corporate location decision-making. Taxes are only one of them. And then, and, and so you would, you know, definitely when we see taxes go up, there's some avoidance. But, you know, as taxes have gone down in Canada, we haven't seen them come flocking back. Okay, <clears throat> Al, same question to you, which is if corporations suddenly tomorrow had to pay $180 billion more in taxes because these loopholes and shelters and so on disappeared, what do you think the consequences would be? Uh, let, let's just start by saying that $180 billion number, uh, if you, if you, watch the documentary carefully as I did, I have absolutely no idea where it comes from. I don't, with respect to the authors of, the, of that number and the documentary makers, there, there is no real evidence to support that number. But let's set that aside for the moment and talk about, about the question you're asking. Um, tax policy generally has to take into account uh, the fact that capital is, uh, you know, capital, can, capital flows. Uh, owners of capital make decisions about where they're going to get the highest rate of return. And we, can, we see that in Canada. Alberta markets itself with this so-called Alberta advantage. And one of their advantages is no sales tax. No sales tax and lower tax rates. And so they attract capital out of here on the basis that somebody's going to say, you know, I'm going to locate my operations in Alberta as opposed to say, uh, which jurisdiction should I pick without offending them? perhaps Newfoundland, which, well, Newfoundland's getting competitive, but a higher tax jurisdiction. So those sorts of decisions, taxes are an expense, and rational economic actors minimize expenses. So I think we can go as far as saying that whatever tax policy choices we make, we have to be mindful of a number of competing goals. Okay, but One having, of them is that. Having said that, do you feel that you're, in some respects, um, championing a tough sell Having come out of the Great Recession, we know that whatever the number is, we know it's more than a billion. You say it's not as high as 180 billion. Somewhere, we know it's at least in the tens of billions. Okay, so somewhere in there, there are tens of billions of dollars that are not being repatriated to Canada because they're sitting in bank accounts offshore. And that's money that potentially could be going to build hospitals, potentially could be going to pave roads, potentially could be going to build social housing, balance the books, whatever you like instead of sitting in a corporate bank account somewhere. I don't, you know, I, I, th th that's something the documentary says, that there's this money, sit do, you, do they think that, for example, when you, have a, when you use a tax haven in which you report a portion of your profit, that the cash is sitting in a tax haven in a bank account? Do they really think that? Because that makes no sense. What's that, the truth? Well, most of this money that is, you know, for example, uh, some of these, the, 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 the profits are earned globally, taxed in different jurisdictions, and then what's left over, the capital that's left over, is redeployed productively in different places. This idea, and you see this in the documentary of people sitting on the beach, and there's banks there, and there's $80 billion sitting around, frankly, is, there's just nothing to that. But the answer, well, my, my basic point data. is, my basic point is, and I don't disagree with a lot of what Diana says, my basic point is, we just have to be mindful that when we take steps, whatever they are, closing loopholes, giving write-offs, taking away write-offs, that you have to balance our economic objectives with our social objectives. And you can do that sensibly. In fact, most of the concerns you're identifying, the OECD is studying the problem as we speak. And there will be new rules coming out to deal with some of these problems. These problems arose because we've become so globalized and the tax law hasn't kept up with how the economy is unfolding. Okay, let's let Diana respond to that. Uh, well, a couple of things. One, on, on the costing, there is good data coming out of the banks in terms of the dollar figure, so you can cost that tax implication and the foregone taxes, and it's well into the, the high tens of billions, if not the hundreds of billions, so that costing is easy enough to do. Um, the second thing is, um, when in terms of the money sitting around, what we see in StatsCan data and other data is that, in fact, corporations are sitting on larger and larger um, hordes of cash, not spending it, not investing it. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that, but the reality is, you know, StatsCan's latest figure that I saw was over $600 billion sitting around not being invested in terms of the Canadian economy. So that money isn't always going back into productive investment. And in terms of when it does, one of the things we've seen consistently in the tax, um, you know, so the question of taxes versus government spending, 
and you know the, this false argument that if you give a tax cut you can get this GDP and job effect that that's, makes it more than pay for itself. The reality we're seeing in the data is that if you tax that and your government spends it, say they're spending it on a nurse's salary or a teacher's salary or somebody daycare worker, those people are spending all of their income, almost all of it, locally on goods and services, winter coats for their kids, haircuts for their kids, um, services that create jobs and in a local economy. So that, that if the government taxes that money and spends it on service delivery, it goes into our economy, it creates more jobs and investment and it's good for the economy. If it's given as a tax break, the, uh, the vast majority of it is either spent on finance investments, speculative investments, debt repayment, condos off in Hawaii or just leaves the country altogether because a bunch of those corporations are foreign held. Okay, forgive so me. So we see a lot of leakage on that um, at tax side that you don't if the government taxes it and spends it. So the effect for us is bigger if you can get it taxed. Understood. Forgive me for jumping in, but uh, as much as I've enjoyed this debate, we actually want to show the documentary now. So let me thank Diana Gibson for being there for us on the left coast in Vancouver, British Columbia, and Al Meiji here in our Toronto studios. Uh, appreciate your participation on the program tonight. Thank you, Steve. And Diana, it was a pleasure to thank meet you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.